This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. For a second day, people have been lining up to pay their respects to John Crosby. The legendary politician is lying in state inside the House of Assembly in St. John's, where that viewing is winding down. Once again, Here and Now's Peter Cowan is there. Peter, you've spent two days now talking with the many people who've come to pay their respects. What strikes you from, from some of the conversations you've had? Anthony, it's amazing how many people didn't even meet the man, but yet they have a John Crosby memory or story or something that they wanted to share. You saw many of the people in the big long lineups that we saw today here at Confederation Building, uh, people who just really felt the impact that he made on this province and wanted to come and share some of those memories and maybe tell some of John Crosby's family just how important it was for them. We saw the line snaking right around the lobby here of Confederation Building and even though right now the visitation is supposed to be over, we still have lots of people inside who are wanting to talk to the family. And there's certainly in that lineup and in the visitation today, we did see plenty of well-known faces. Uh, people like former Premier Paul Davis. We've seen uh, former cabinet ministers who uh, we've had senators. Uh, but as I said, lots of other individual people. And here are some of the stories and some of the things that they're remembering about John Crosby. Even my father at one point voted Tory and we were liberals. There was only God and Joey Smallwood on our our dining room, uh, but he saw that, uh, that John Crosby was doing good for Newfoundland and Labrador. With the passing of John Crosby, we've lost a great human being, a great statesman, and somebody who is, uh, he's lost to us, but not in memory. He is still with us, and he smiled. One time he was coming out home and my dad said to me, we better get a bottle of Valentino scotch. And they said, uh, make sure we have it for Mr. Crosby. <laughs> and uh, I had never heard tell of a uh, Valentino scotch before, but after the century I went. And uh, when he came to the house that evening, he sat down, he had his drink of scotch, and he said, you know, it's going to be a great election campaign. He said, and he said, uh, he said let's toast. Toast the new government. And sure enough, uh, Brian Maroney won the government. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of a foreshadowing what was going to happen. There's two people that saved this province, John Crosby, and Brian Mulroney. They did a big, big deal. Those two guys did a massive deal in saving this province as far as the oil and gas industry in this province. Now, but for them, I don't know where this province would be. I, I just felt he was very much uh, a big part of Newfoundland and a, and a dynamic politician and um, a great comedian if he had wanted to be one. <laughs> And even though I didn't know him personally, I felt I knew him. And I think an awful lot of people kind of feel that way. We see there the honor guard that has been standing next to Mr. Crosby's urn for the last two days to pay their respects. They're writing a few memories in that book for the family. Uh, and of course, now that the visitation is over, we look forward to the funeral. And we've just received confirmation that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is planning to be at the funeral tomorrow, along with several former prime ministers, several former cabinet ministers, quite the list of dignitaries. And we are expecting uh, Brian Mulroney and Chess Crosby will be the two that are eulogizing him in that service tomorrow. Reporting live at Confederation Building, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Well, as Peter mentioned, while this was the last day of public visitation for John Crosby, the province is passing along messages of support to the family. So anybody who wasn't able to make it to the Confederation Building this week, well, you can send condolences, if you wish, to the Crosbys via email. And the address that the government has set up is messages at gov.nl.ca. Newfoundland and Labrador is saying goodbye to John Crosby. On Thursday, you can watch the funeral for John Crosby on CBC TV, News Network, YouTube, and Facebook. The funeral service will also be broadcast live on CBC Radio. Special coverage with me, Anthony Germain, and CBC News Network host Heather Hiscox, as well as reporter Peter Cowan. That special coverage starts at 1.30 Newfoundland time, 1 in Labrador. The funeral for John Crosby, Thursday, live on CBC.
Well, to other stories now, there's trouble on the streets of St. John's. Two more pedestrians were struck by vehicles yesterday, and many people are speaking out about snow-covered roads. Yesterday afternoon, a person walking on Freshwater Road was hit by the side mirror of a passing vehicle. Police say the man was examined in hospital. And last night, a woman was struck while walking on New Gower Street. Now, police say she wasn't injured. There have now been nine pedestrians injured by vehicles in the metro area since the new year began. And all but one of those incidents happened at night. Now, this all started on January 4th when the man was knocked down while crossing Elizabeth Avenue. And then a week later, on January 11th, there were three separate incidents in a single day. Two people injured on Commonwealth Avenue, another on Main Road in Goulds, and yet another on St. Thomas Line in Paradise. And on January 13th, a man and a woman were struck down on Rope Walk Lane with a woman suffering serious injuries. So you add to that two collisions last night, and it totals nine injured pedestrians in seven separate collisions. Now people are posting angry comments on social media, many of those directed at the city of St. John's. And those comments point to the piles of snow, which leave no room to walk on the streets, forcing pedestrians into very dangerous situations. Now the city will be holding a news conference tomorrow to address those concerns. <laughs> Yeah, certainly uh, not a good situation considering we've had some pretty nice weather so people are getting out and enjoying the weather. We can thank an area of high pressure for that. That has sunk south now of the island allowing some more cloud cover to move in but we are hanging on to these colder temperatures and we've seen that uh, for the past couple of days. Now looking ahead because that's what everybody's talking about. We have another area of low pressure. It doesn't look like much right now just south of Ontario. That's going to head our way as we head uh, Thursday night into Friday and continue uh, through the day. We already have some winter storm watches in effect uh, for most of eastern Newfoundland uh, with some special weather statements towards the interior. I'll have all the details and time out the system when I come back, Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Another storm, obviously. Well, police in Cornerbrook, they are not providing much in the way of details about Cornerbrook minor hockey's missing money. But here and now has learned that police have been investigating the case now for nearly one year. As we reported last night, more than $80,000 is owed to the city. A 46-year-old woman, a former association employee, has been charged in relation to this missing money. She's facing six charges, including theft and fraud, over $5,000. A police investigation began last March when financial irregularities were discovered. The RNC says when investigating community groups, there are certain sensitivities involved. You're dealing with a volunteer organization. So not only are we uh, you know, trying to determine uh, you know, what has transpired, but we're also trying to protect those that, uh, that have not been involved and certainly, uh, you know, make sure that we cover off all the bases and that we, uh, that we identify the, the people that are responsible and, and also uh, exonerate the people that are not. Staff of the rooms held an information session this afternoon to show what a proposed condo would look like from their iconic view. I'm Jeremy and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. And we're going to get to Jeremy's story right now. Today at the rooms, you could see more than just an exhibit. You could also see a potential and controversial condo development in downtown St. John's. The Parish Lane residence hopes to be built in place of the Cathedral Parish Hall located on Queen's Road. Well, this afternoon, the rooms offered a new view to concerned residents as well as to the condo developer. Jeremy Eaton has that story. It's the rooms with a view. From the third floor of the St. John's Museum, you're offered one of the best views of the city. Today, though, folks got the chance to see how a condo building could change that view. Well, I think people appreciated it, appreciated the chance to take a look at what it really looks like. You know, we've made some changes uh, to the building um, since we had our public meeting in November. Hardy says his company has reduced the height of the building by 1.8 meters, meaning the roof won't block the view. With the proposed building possibly going up across the street, the rooms wanted to let its patrons and the public see what it'll all look like. And the placement right there at that iconic point, I think gives as realistic a view as we can get without actually building the structure. 
The rooms opened up the space so that people could talk directly to the developers. Staff were also there asking people for their thoughts. I think really we're in the process of forming our opinion. Uh, as I say, we've been following this uh, more recently uh, through the city planning process. We've tried to educate ourselves on the proposal. A few dozen people turned up for the afternoon information session to see what the building would look like. But change is never easy. No doubt this is a change. This will be a change to the view. Uh, whether it's a good or bad change is not really for me totally to decide. So what we want to do is, is understand those changes. It'll be a different view from the, from the rooms, but we're not impeding view of some of the critical uh, parts of the city, including the harbor, the cathedral, the narrows, Cabot Tower. Um, I think we work really well with those and I think people can see that. Staff at the rooms also took the opportunity to gather feedback from the people who showed up here to the information session. It says it will gather it, put it together, and then present it to the city of St. John's. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, to the west coast now, crafters in Cornerbrook are putting needle to thread to support the more than one billion, yes, one billion creatures impacted by the Australia bushfires. They're making joey pouches, and these are used to hold baby kangaroos and other marsupials, much like the females' pouches. Troy Turner with that story. They're following each pattern with careful attention. Material has to be cut precisely, stitches have to be secure, and the liners have to be just so. The Cornerbrook joey pouches are being sewn and will be shipped out soon. For Amanda Young, who visited Australia in high school, news of the fires brought heartbreak. Having pet the koalas, having pet and, and fed the kangaroos while I was there, I think that, that kind of, um, there was like a, almost like a connection there that made me feel a little bit more emotional, I guess, about uh, the animals losing their homes. Young and Amanda Sharp are two of the many Cornerbrook residents contributing to the cause. Sharp was sparked by news that Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison was initially vacationing in Hawaii while fires ravaged his country. It just really hit me hard because it seemed to be another leader in government just like not being behind his people, not being there when they needed him. And to me, I would have felt a sense of abandonment and just the anxiety and stress, the extra anxiety and stress that would have caused when you're already in the middle of like all that stress, you, your leader should have been there for you. Morrison later apologized and cut his trip short. For millions of devastated creatures, the devil's in the details. So the group is using approved patterns and materials provided by the Facebook group From Newfoundland to Australia with Love. Sharp and Young organized a sewing day over the weekend. About 15 people showed up to learn and lend their support. The completed Joey pouches will be sent to St. John's this Friday. After that, they'll be shipped to Australia, where they'll wait at a warehouse to be used as needed. Troy Turner, CBC News, Corner Brook. So being here at the Youth Olympics representing Canada, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that in itself. And the curling is a, is a good bonus, I guess. Local curler Nathan Young certainly turned heads at the Youth Olympics in Switzerland. Well, he won't be holding the championship trophy this year. We're going to ask what the future holds for the 17-year-old from Torbay.
This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. Another sunny, albeit crisp, uh, kind of January day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a beautiful morning. It was beautiful. Still cold, though. Yes. A little bit. Yeah, right. it was. I like I like it when the sun's shining, though. This is like my ideal yeah. weather. Cool temperatures. You can always dress for it. It's beautiful. It's true. And get out and enjoy it. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you, obviously, mm. tomorrow's a big day. We've got uh, special coverage for John Crosby's funeral. Yes. Uh, there'll be people lining up uh, early, I suspect, before the doors open. What kind of weather are we looking at, you know, for tomorrow afternoon? See, the good news is, is these cold temperatures are actually moving out. So we are going to see a warm-up as we head through the day tomorrow. Okay. And that is ahead of the next weather maker. But tomorrow, wind's pretty light. So it looks like it'll be uh, not too bad right. out there. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, as we mentioned, temperatures this morning, Absolutely uh, chilly in some areas. Minus 13 for St. John's. Uh, areas that were in the lower le elevation or lower uh, levels were uh, seeing temperatures in the minus 20s, recorded those uh, coolest temperatures of the season so far. Minus 26 for Lab City and minus 23 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now, if we take a look at where we're sitting right now, didn't really move much. Minus 9 uh, this afternoon for St. John's, or currently sitting at minus 9, rather. Uh, same for Cornerbrook as you head across the island, uh, minus 12 in Gander, and then Happy Valley Goose Bay currently sitting at minus 14, and it's still about minus 17 for Lab City. So taking a look at the future tracker, there's not a whole lot going on. The area of high pressure is moving south. It is allowing a little bit of a disturbance to move through. We're seeing some flurries along the west coast. That's going to continue to spread east as we head through the night tonight along the Buren Peninsula. Avalon Peninsula will likely see a few flurries as we head through the night tonight. Tomorrow, not a whole lot going on either. Just uh, some light snow potentially along the west and south coast. Less than five centimeters in accumulation. Higher elevations may see a little bit more than that, but overall not a whole lot going on through the day tomorrow. You can see a little bit more uh, heavier precipitation down along the south coast, but again, still should be under the five centimeter mark. And uh, as far as those temperatures go tonight, uh, pretty much going to be sitting where we are right now for the metro area. Minus nine overnight tonight, dipping again towards central. Grand Falls winds are likely going down into the mid minus 20s, minus 15 for Cornerbrook. Another chilly night for Happy Valley Goose Bay under clear skies and relatively calm winds. Minus 27 will be your overnight low. And then we're looking at uh, really anywhere in Lab West, looking at temperatures in the mid minus 20s, uh, warmer than it was last night, though, that's for sure. Uh, and temperatures in the minus 20s along the coast. But again, winds overall generally light across the island and same up through the big land. Now, temperatures tomorrow are going to warm up by about five, four to five degrees across the island for most of us. And then again, all this flurry activity along the coast, both the south and uh, west coast, will stick around through the day. Everything else, we should see some sun and then that snow will move in late day and that's ahead of the next weather maker that's moving in. Up through Labrador, you get to sit that one out. A beautiful uh, afternoon, albeit cold, minus 23 for Lab City. Those winds staying generally light. Up through the northern portions of the Big Land, though, you're still looking at winds 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. So let's uh, talk about the system that's moving in for Friday and, or rather, yeah, for Friday and Saturday for the most part. Winter storm watch is already in effect. Uh, from the Bay of Exploits through the Avalon, including the Buren Peninsula, and then a special weather statement for uh, areas of the interior, uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, and the Conagra Peninsula. If we time out what's happening as far as this system goes, the low is currently uh, just south of Ontario. That's going to head towards the Maritime Provinces by Thursday, bringing snow there, and then Thursday night after midnight is when we should start to see that snow for the Avalon Peninsula. That system strengthening and with that I've added some of the wind barbs here. They're going to be strong winds already by Friday morning with some of the heaviest uh, snow falling. It looks like right now will be the Avalon Peninsula and then those winds really ramping up overnight Friday as this low tracks offshore and we could see winds in excess of 100 maybe even 120 kilometer per hour gusts and then that will continue uh, to move off into Saturday clearing out. So it is going to be a big one. We'll talk numbers when I get back and we'll talk about just how much uh, uh, snow is falling when I come back. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Well, certainly good to be a growler these days. Last night, the Newfoundland team extended their winning streak to a franchise high of 10 games. He'll walk it to the middle. Hands off Johnson across. Score!
And that's not all. The Growlers haven't lost a home game, and get this, since October the 19th. That's 15 straight wins on home ice. Last night's 4-1 victory was over the Kansas City Mavericks at mile one. He's pretty excited. Tonight, the Growlers face off against Kansas City again. The home team continues to rank first in its ECHL division and third place in the league overall. Well, Erica Curtis and her curling team are going to represent this province at the upcoming Scotties Tournament of Hearts. The Curtis Rink won the provincial championship last night. The Women's Provincial Championship wasn't easy to win this year. Curtis had to win three games in just one day to win the title and earn the right to head to the Nationals. The team went into the finals as the underdogs, taking on an undefeated team. With the provincial title in hand, the Curtis Rink will head to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan next month to represent the province at the Scotties. It was a little difficult. The hardest part was probably being quite exhausted. Um, three games is a lot in one day. But uh, you know what, we took each game one end at a time, and uh, well, here we are now. <laughs> and staying with curling, Team Canada, led by Torbay-born skip Nathan Young, came close to victory during the playoff round of the Youth Olympics in Switzerland today. But in the end, Japan won. It was close, though, 5-4. to four. A dramatic finish in an extra end. Young had a tough draw to the button for the victory, but as you'll see crashed on a guard just before the rings. Well, the 17-year-old is pleased with how the team played overall, and we managed to reach Young in Switzerland after the big game. Just by looking at the score, I think you can tell both teams played, uh, played pretty well. I mean, it was only 4-3 to three in the eighth end, and uh, we managed to hold them to one, and... We had a draw to the button in the ninth end to win, and uh, and I missed that. But otherwise, you know, a few shots here and there for both teams, I think it's, it, that would be fair to say. But uh, no otherwise, it was a good game. Well, I, I can tell you that I, I was nervous throwing that, that last shot. Uh, you know, it's not, particularly for me, where I haven't had a lot of experience, haven't had many opportunities where, you know, you're, you're throwing an extra end, draw to the button to win. But I think in that moment, I was just trying to tell myself it's just a, 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 you know, a plain draw to the button, just like you're home at the curling club throwing a practice draw. And uh, but I was, was kind of struggling with that miss all week. A couple times that happened where the intern draw just stayed super straight. And uh, this one stayed straight as well and just ticked the guard. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, overall. You know, I could definitely see each game. I was... I was learning and, and taking new things forward and working on small things here and there. And uh, I, I'd love to be playing, uh, well, I would have loved to have played this afternoon and tomorrow, but mixed doubles are still coming up, so we can still look forward to that. Just being here at the Youth Olympics representing Canada, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, that in itself. And the curling is a, is a good bonus, I guess. But um, no, you know... That we like this team. We haven't had a whole lot of time playing together and practicing together, uh, so we're just trying to fast track it as much as we can. But you could definitely notice a difference. Each game, we were getting more comfortable with each other and with the ice and with the rocks, and we kept getting better and better. And, and that's all you can ask for in a team like this. And uh, no, it's just an amazing experience. Well, it's something every competitive athlete strives for: is to eventually represent Canada. And you never know. No matter how, how good you are or whatever, how you know if it's ever going to happen. So, just to be able to be here and to be wearing the uh, the Canada flag on our back, uh, that's just it's just amazing. And you know, you never know if it's going to happen again. So, we're, I'm just trying to take it all in. When I first started curling. It was my, my parents really had to kind of push me uh, push me to do it. Uh, as with every sport I tried, I wasn't the most uh, uh, into sports, I guess you could say, when I was really young. But no, my parents kept trying me in different sports, and curling stuck. And uh, you know, I'm pretty. I'm. I could never have imagined it. Uh, it would turn out to to these experiences that I'm able to experience. I, I definitely would like to see uh, the rest of my junior, kind of my junior career through. So that's that's three or four years. Uh, after that, uh, I'm. As of right now, I have, don't really have an interest in pursuing professional curling. Um, 
so uh, so we'll see what happens after my juniors. But as of right now, I, I want to win in, in terms of curling. I want to win a Canadian junior and, and represent Canada again at a, at a junior Worlds. Those exchanges with Pierre Trudeau and the Rat Pack and all of those uh, moments, really we haven't seen them before. Well, maybe we've seen them before, but we certainly don't see them to the same degree. No. Preparations are underway for tomorrow, the funeral of John Crosby at the Anglican Cathedral in St. John's. Delighted to say that Heather Hiscox will join me in hosting tomorrow's special coverage. Our conversation after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. The Anglican Cathedral is going to be packed tomorrow with dignitaries, former prime ministers, the premier, 
as people pay their respects to John Crosby. And CBC has this covered in a special tomorrow. And I'm delighted that Heather Hiscox is coming to town uh, to co-host our special coverage. Heather, welcome back to me. Oh, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be working with you again. And I'm so glad to be here. I've been inside the Basilica, which is spectacular, right. but never inside the cathedral. And it's going to be magnificent yeah. with these 800 people tomorrow for the service. It is quite something. Now, you and I are of a certain generation where we actually remember when John Crosby well, was a cabinet minister. What are your thoughts about, about the man? We've been sort of thinking about him since he passed away and covering, but what are your thoughts about him? I think it's a wonderful time to be able to remember what a dominant figure he was because he's been in declining health for many years and he's been stepped back from his public role. Maybe people of a certain generation don't remember what a giant he was, certainly here for you, but for all of us in the rest of Canada. And I think we, we think of the Crosbyisms and the quips and the right. exchanges with Sheila Copps and all of those things, but it's a chance to really reflect on how important he was to people here but in, in what he contributed as far as free trade and your offshore oil industry and all of the major policy things that he uh, was the driver yeah. of that we maybe lost sight of. No question, Heather, a lot of, uh, a lot of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are delighted that uh, you're here, that people outside the province are actually going to be part of this, this farewell to this larger than life uh, figure. Why did you want to be here? because I was always disappointed. I mean, I was a student when he was in Ottawa. I wish I could have been in the press gallery uh, to be covering his time there because those exchanges with Pierre Trudeau and the Rat Pack and all of those uh, moments, really we haven't seen them before. Well, maybe we've seen them before, but we certainly don't see them to the same no. degree now. Yeah. And just to be able to reflect on that time and to realize that this is a man who was so dominant here for more than 40 years in so many, in, critical capacities. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just delighted to be able to pay tribute and to listen to the stories. I've spent a lot of time with cousins and with Newfoundlanders and Labradorians as they tell me what he meant to them and that's yeah. just a wonderful moment of coming together that I'm just delighted mm -hmm. to share in. Well, I know that uh, we last worked together during the Beaumont Hamill, Beaumont Hamill special, yes. 100 years, and I really look forward to tomorrow. So I'll thank you so much for As coming. Do I. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. And it's important to point out that our special coverage tomorrow, it's not a gigantic lament. Obviously, there'll be very solemn moments here in the Anglican Cathedral tomorrow, but it's also to remember uh, as Heather put it, John Crosby's life, you know, uh, a man in his late 80s, an amazing career here in Newfoundland, as well as in Ottawa. So tune in tomorrow. The funeral coverage starts at 1.30 island time, and that's uh, on the main network, on local television, on Facebook, on YouTube, as well as on radio. And I hope you tune in. Well, while hundreds are expected to pay their respects to John Crosby tomorrow at his funeral, there is another place in St. John's where he can be remembered. The Rooms has set up an exhibit and a book of condolences in its lobby. John Crosby passed away last week and he was such an important figure here in Newfoundland, Labrador and nationally uh, that we decided to do an exhibit on what we have in a collection relating to, uh, to John. So what we have is we have... Um, a picture of him when he became uh, Lieutenant Governor and we have about three buttons from his time in different campaigns and his book and the picture of him as a child that is actually part of the archival collection here from the uh, LC Holloway collection. But it was a very quick turnaround of course for this. Friday came in and said we should do a, a commemorative um, exhibit on, on John Crosby uh, so we, we did. We would spend the morning choosing artifacts and looking and writing and then by the afternoon it was in production and by Friday afternoon it was up. And it's, it's a very sad, um, sad event of course and John was a wonderful uh, patron to the arts and uh, he had myself down and my uh, director to the government house when he was lieutenant governor for uh, tea one, one day to talk about our work and um, he was just a very lovely man so we thought it was really important to, uh, to have a small exhibit here to remember him and put out a, a book of remembrance so that people can come in and sign it and remember, um, remember John Crosby and his contribution to the province. Well, he was the love of her life as she was his. Those are the words that John and Jane Crosby's family have used to describe the couple's relationship. The pair were married in 1952 and they went on to raise a family all while living a life of politics and public service. Well, now, as people are remembering John Crosby, they are also reflecting on his other love. <laughs> See, all the little animals love me, now I'm retired. I worked with the Crosbys as the honorary naval aide-de-camp. 
I've been there for a number of years, and when Mr. Crosby was appointed the government house, I was asked to stay on, and I have gotten to know the Crosbys really through that period. They were gems. They were, they were very special people. They were considerate. They looked out for you. At times, you know, Mr. Crosby could be a little gruff around the edges, but inside was this teddy bear who really looked after people. Mrs. Crosby always made it a point of asking about my children, where they were, how they were doing. Uh, they would go so far as even to bake cookies and things like that. I want also to thank my wife, Jane, my partner for 30 years, for her tremendous assistance to me throughout my career and throughout this campaign. We met through a mutual dear friend and we've been thick as thieves ever since, quite frankly. Remember me to one who lives there. For she wants what they do love now. Little known fact, John Crosby loved Bob Dylan. <laughs> you know, uh, so I went down there one day and down at the Hogan's Pond, down the country house, and I said, what the heck have you got on? I thought it was a radio station, you know? He said, what's the matter with you? Don't you know, genius, when you hear it in music? I said, that's Bob Dylan. And he said, yeah. I said, after all these years, I didn't know you loved Bob Dylan. Whether John Crosby will run in another election will depend on his wife, Jane. She traveled with him almost everywhere he went. At times on the campaign, she appeared worried he may be pushing himself too hard. At other times, their closeness was very apparent. We were talking the other day when I was over there and she was talking about an event they went to. John had just flown in from Houston and Calgary and she wrote in her journal, he really didn't want to go but it was a close personal friend um, who was throwing this event. So they, they went and he really, really loved it. And she said, he came home grumpy because when I don't go with him, he always comes home grumpy because he missed me. She had that written in her journal. That was like 15 years ago. That's how close they were. You know, sometimes when you see the birthday announcements on the, on the telly, you know, and somebody is, you know, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, and you go, oh my gosh, how beautiful is that? And well, it, those people, you know, our grandparents and stuff like that, they know that kind of love. And, and that's what John and Jane had. And they uh, had it in their private life, uh, in their public life, and they passed it on to their children. I don't think you can say much more about anybody than that. A person who has lived his life in such uh, love, companionship, and service. Wow, pretty darn good. And that's why this whole flipping country is mourning. What a smile Jane Crosby has to this very day. And I just want, we've actually talked a lot about John Crosby's memoirs as we've celebrated his life over the last week since he passed away on Friday. And we spent a lot of time talking about John Crosby's wit. Well, Jane Crosby had a pretty sharp, smart tongue as well. If you go back to 1979, one of my favorite memories in Crosby's book, this is right after his budget with Joe Clark was defeated. Jane told John Crosby, who was very grumpy and upset, she said, look, John, the operation was a, was a success, but the doctor died. Jane Crosby, she's also working on her own book. We'll have details on that, hopefully, in a few weeks on Here and Now.
Welcome back to here now to the big land now where some Labradorians are taking exception to comments made by Port of Basque Mayor John Spencer. This after Spencer told CBC earlier this week that he plans to work against a fixed link between the island and the mainland. Spencer calls it a tunnel to nowhere. So not surprisingly, some people who might benefit from that tunnel, well, they're not too happy with Mr. Spencer. Jacob Barker with that story. Basque's Mayor John Spencer does not like the idea of a fixed link between Newfoundland and Labrador. Why are we going to spend all this money uh, to develop a, a costly venture of a tunnel going nowhere? Try telling that to the people in Labrador and on the north shore of Quebec. Many took to social media to voice their concerns over the mayor's comment. Amy Norman said it was an example of the growing animosity of Labrador from people on the island. Former Goose Bay Mayor Jamie Snook calls it a nation-building and visionary project that would make the province and country stronger. At a potential cost of $1.65 billion and with political and geographical hurdles to overcome, a fixed link is far from becoming a reality. I must rename myself as the minister, a member from uh, Western Nowhere if we keep up with this attitude. That's something Labrador West MHA Jordan Brown recognizes, but he says the mayor's comments aren't helpful. Comments that like that have persisted for the last number of decades that paint Labrador and Labradorians as nowhere. Uh, so when you go into the, the, the court of public opinion, when there's a project or anything like that in Labrador, it always gets that reaction of, oh, why are we doing this in nowhere? He says the mayor should have remained focused on the economics of the project. That's the words that should have been used. It's not economical. He, he, he shouldn't have cast this light that Labrador is nowhere and that you know we shouldn't do projects there. Spencer says a fixed link could spell the end for his town, which is home to the ferry terminal, which connects to the mainland. Today, he took the opportunity to clarify his comment. He says he took the idea from this iPolitics article about Route 138. That connects to the area in Quebec's North Shore, which is incomplete. It's an article that refers to the fact that Route 138 is not even started. It started, but it's, not, it's, it's 400 kilometers of vacant uh, land up on the North Shore of Quebec. Oh my goodness, no. There was never any intent to figuratively refer to the big land as nowhere. Spencer says his concerns are about the economics of the proposed project and in no way was directed at the communities on the other side of the water. Please don't think that I don't want to see improvements in the infrastructure of Labrador. I want to see improvements in the infrastructure right across this nation. If this project were to become a reality, it's a long way off. The federal government says that a full feasible study would still be required, and it's working closely with the province on next steps. Jacob Barker, CBC News. Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, national news tonight, Canada is in the midst of a peak flu season. There have been more than 12,000 cases confirmed right across the country, and at least 10 people have died so far. This year, multiple strains of flu are appearing, and as Christine Birak tells us, pneumonia is often the result. Ticket Y, 056, triage 2. Most people walking into emergency right now are feverish, coughing. <laughs> their bodies exhausted by the flu virus. Is it possible that this year is going to be worse than previous years? Yes, it is. Doctors have seen a staggering number of patients, including more children than usual for this time of year. We saw 510 people come through our emergency department and our after hours kids clinic on that day. So very, very busy. In one day? In one 24 hour period, yes, 510. The flu kills about 3,000 Canadians every year, often young children, the elderly, and those with pre-existing medical conditions. It's a combination of burden, I think, and, and complexity. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Mark Loeb says healthy people typically get sick for about a week and recover from the flu, but the virus takes a toll, weakening the body's ability to fight off other bugs and illnesses. Why are we concerned about the flu? We're concerned about the flu because of its complications, right? And one of the most important complications is pneumonia. That's usually, typically, what leads to death. Wendy Wilson cracked a rib coughing. What started as a sore throat before Christmas turned into pneumonia by the new year. When I was taken in breaths, it was like, and I was afraid to walk fast or move too fast because it was like all of a sudden I start coughing and I feel like I can't catch my breath. The flu virus usually attacks the upper respiratory tract, including the nose, throat, and respiratory tubes. Pneumonia targets the lungs, which is why patients have trouble breathing. 
best. If you're walking around your home and climbing to the top of the stairs is really winding you and you normally would not be winded by that, that's a concern. Her advice, get the flu shot. Some protection is always better than none. It can also prevent you from spreading a virus that could land someone in the hospital and cost others their lives. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, shifting to international news, some stunning events in Russia to tell you about. The country's prime minister and his entire cabinet unexpectedly resigned today. And that's a move that helps President Vladimir Putin tighten the clench of his iron fist on power. The CBC's Chris Brown now with that story. One thing Vladimir Putin has promised and delivered for Russians on consistently over the last 20 years that he's been in power is political stability. No abrupt changes, not too many big surprises. Well, today, a fairly sizable departure from that. In a major speech, he talked about his proposals to change Russia's constitution, to devolve the powers of the president and to give them to other bodies, such as the parliament or, or the Duma. The idea uh, going forward would be that the parliament would have to appoint the prime minister, the parliament would have to appoint cabinet ministers, and that's something right now uh, that the president does. He is banned by law for running for a third term, and today he said he's not going to change that law. So someone else will presumably become the president, but a far weaker president than what he is. And he's also in the process creating a couple of options for himself to move into, potentially a much more powerful prime minister's role, perhaps something different with another body called the state council. Uh, either way, he seems to be, with these measures, with his proposals, trying to ensure that he remains at the center of Russian politics, indeed the most important, most powerful political figure in Russia long after his presidential term ends. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Back home now, Peter McKay says he's definitely interested in the leadership race. And Mr. McKay will be at John Crosby's funeral tomorrow. The former Conservative cabinet minister has officially joined the contest to replace Andrew Scheer as party leader. McKay posted the announcement today to his social media accounts, and that ends weeks of speculation about whether he would run at all. McKay was the leader of the old Progressive Conservative Party when it merged with the Canadian Alliance in 2003. He was appointed to several senior cabinet posts by his new boss, then Conservative leader Stephen Harper. Is back in so I'm 30 years old. I spent about half my life in jail. More jail time for Philip Penn. To be honest with you, that's the life I live. It's just who I've been for so long.
The weather update is brought to you by Beltone, your partner in better hearing. Everybody uh, on social media and even going around places, people talking about what's going to happen Thursday night, and Ashley's going to uh, give you uh, her best forecast in just a moment. But I get this uh, tweet from Walter Harding, a here and now CBC fan, who says you should remind people to check their dryer vents and their air exchange vents and uh, not to sort of smack them on right after the big storm because sometimes you can end up with a little air exchange problem, maybe possible fire. So some good yeah. advice. And yeah. You know, we're not really looking at anything until late tomorrow, so you got some time to make sure. It oh yeah, lots of time. Well, tomorrow night after yeah. night after midnight it'll okay. start. So yeah, you definitely yeah. have time. Clear what you can. How many centimeters? Now. How many centimeters? A lot, a lot. Yeah, we'll do. That's specific. <laughs> it's super specific. Very brave. <laughs> Let's take a look at what the future tracker is saying first, just to time it out. Uh, it does look like uh, snow is going to start overnight Friday, uh, or rather overnight Thursday into Friday morning. So here's a look at that system right now. We're going to start to see that snow move in. The strongest winds uh, with this system look like they'll be overnight Friday into Saturday morning as that low moves off. But the trend of this system is moving south and east, and that's bringing the heaviest snowfall right along with it uh, as of now. And those winds, you can see the wind field's quite large with this system. So as much as those winds are going to be really strong, certainly for the northeast coast, really the entire province is going to see uh, the effects of those winds as we head through the day on Friday. That'll move off, clearing things out by Saturday. Still going to see some lingering flurry activity, though, uh, as those winds continue to stay quite strong as well. But we will eventually see uh, a little bit of clearing and behind that we've got another system, but let's get first through the first one and then we'll start talking about that one. So here's a look at uh, what I'm expecting snowfall wise still have another day to fine tune the forecast, but those temperatures are even cold uh, as we head towards central. So I still have gander in that 20 to 40 centimeter range significantly less as you head further west. Uh, Cornerbrook only looking at anywhere probably closer to the 5 to 10 centimeter range, but I still have you in that 15 centimeter. But the one to note really is uh, Bonavista Peninsula and the Avalon Peninsula. That's where it looks like the heaviest snow will fall. Somewhere in between there, we will more than likely see 40 to 60 even could see some higher amounts. Now with this wind, it'll be blowing around, so it'll kind of be hard to determine just how much snow fell, but that is what uh, we're looking at right now. So the other thing to note, mention those winds. They are gonna be strong. They're gonna pick up uh, early on Friday morning, as you can see widespread gusts anywhere from uh, 50 to about 70 kilometers per hour. And then as we head through the day on Friday, even stronger. This is when we'll start to get into that 100, 90 to 100 kilometer per hour range with those gusts and even more so overnight. Now those 100 kilometer per hour gusts is when we're gonna see the heaviest snowfall tapering off, but still gonna be strong uh, as far as those snowfall rates go overnight Saturday. Look at 130 to 140 kilometers per hour is possible in those exposed areas. So certainly something uh, to think about as we're heading through uh, the next couple of days, likely gonna see widespread areas of uh, some blizzard conditions as we uh, head through the day. So. It's going to be uh, it's going to be busy. So for Friday, this is what we're looking at those temperatures. I mentioned cooler temperatures as you head towards central. So minus eight, minus 14 for Cornerbrook. But uh, as you head towards the Avalon, those temperatures will be hovering just below the zero degree mark. Beautiful up through Labrador. You get to sit this one out, as I kept mentioning, minus 26 for Lab City as uh, as your afternoon high. So that's a look at your forecast. We'll look at your weather photo when I come back.
Well, we've been talking about all the snow coming this way. Yep. Yeah, well, bone chilling conditions are the story from Saskatchewan to British Columbia, and extreme cold alerts are in place. The wind chill is making it feel like minus 50 in some places. Unbelievable. And on top of the frigid temperatures in BC, another major snowfall happening today. So the other side of the country, same deal. Vancouver emergency calls because of slips and falls more than doubled this week. The city trying to focus on ice and snow removal on major roads, bus routes and bridges. Yeah, <laughs> so pretty cold. It's a little and chilly. Uh, like a lot of Newfoundland people, my daughter's in Calgary. She sent me a tweet from the Calgary Zoo mm. that canceled the penguin walk at the zoo because it was too cold for the penguins. Oh, okay. How cold does it have to be to cancel a penguin walk? Apparently that cold. <laughs> wow, crazy. <laughs> well, uh, you definitely had oh. to bundle up if you were heading out. Well, not really, actually. That's it's been nice. Pretty nice. But bundle up for uh, areas across Newfoundland. That's Snowshoeing gorgeous. paradise. It was. Tilting Fogo Island. Regina sent us that uh, wonderful shot of the winter scene there. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Have a great night. Don't forget our special coverage tomorrow of John Crosby's funeral. See you then. Good night.